Welcome to the Inspirational Insights, Insights to Action podcast. I'm Donna Jones, your host. Today, I have with me Maria Mattarelli and Peter Stevens, both of whom have started up and founded a program called Personal Agility and written a book on what that means. We're going to be talking about the whole process and how it's relevant to what's going on in the world today. The personal agility aspect couldn't be more important from a context point of view. We're in a very volatile period of time in human history and our choices make the difference. Welcome, Maria and Peter. Thank you for joining us here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Great to be here. Thank you. And also very <laughs> glad and honored to be here. What inspired you both to get this program running on personal agility and then, of course, write a book about it? How did that come about? I've been a scrum trainer for five years. I've been in the agile movement, sometime in the fringe, sometimes in the heart of it for the better part of 15 years. Life was good, but I was working like crazy. And I felt like I wasn't making any progress, like treading water all the time. Somewhere along the line, I had this epiphany, oh, wait a minute, I'm a scrum trainer. Maybe I could apply scrum to my own life. I started asking myself the questions and exploring that and experimented with, not just Scrum, I also experimented with some other things, things like personal Kanban, uh, seven tips of highly effective people, and, and, and things like that. What actually resonated the most with me was a variation on Scrum, and I started applying it. Um, but I also realized that the problem of running my own life was very different than the problem of leading a software development team. This whole thing of uh, who gets to make decisions. When a team, you've got one person who's allowed to do that, but in my life, there's just me. Things started evolving away from Scrum and kind of taking on their own character. I started sharing that, and I remember getting this one feedback from one of my customers in Zurich. I told him about it, and he said, oh, that's interesting. I didn't hear anything from him for about four months. And then I get this email saying, wow, this really works. That was about the time that I met Maria in Porto for Scrum Day in Portugal. Maria gave a talk about agile marketing, and I thought, oh, wow, she's trying to do something similar to what I'm doing, propagating or launching a new idea. And marketing seems like something I could use. So I reached out to Maria, and we had a chat. We agreed to have a conversation at the next conference, which was the Scrum Gathering in Munich a couple weeks later. And that's where we sat down and had our first real conversation about personal agility. I asked Maria the question, what really matters to you? And that's where Maria started thinking. And Maria, you tell the rest of the story because it's your story. Yeah, thank you, Peter. As an Agilist, I had been applying Agile to many things for years, and I'd been applying Agile in my personal life and been getting amazing results. There was a big challenge I was running into that a lot of Agile teams run into, and that's sustainable pace. What I realized is I could do a lot more stuff and get it done, but I didn't really feel fulfillment. Everything felt like surface level rinse and repeat. When I connected with Peter in Portugal and then a couple weeks later in Germany, I remember we were sitting in the lobby of the Westin Grand in Munich and he asked me that question, what really matters? It was like a scene out of a movie where everything just goes whoosh and like just drops and you're suddenly present. Everything blurs in the background. In that moment, I realized that nothing that I thought mattered mattered at all. In my quest to be successful and have a great career and have freedom and flexibility, getting out of an office job and traveling the world and launching my own consulting company, I realized something that really mattered wasn't even on my radar, and that was my health. I had completely let my health slip, and I realized that nothing mattered if I didn't feel good. I was in and out of the hospital. It was a really challenging experience. I realized I needed to make a big change. So instead of just applying Agile to the things I did in general, as Peter and I were talking about this concept of personal agility and the personal agility system, this approach began to emerge that was really, really incredible. I started applying it into my own life and it completely turned around my world in a positive way. Applying agile to anything can help you achieve more in less time, right? We know that in business, of course, it would apply in your personal life. What I think that personal agility brings in the way that we present it is it helps people not just achieve more, but actually have more meaning and fulfillment in the things that they do. Because it's not just leveraging techniques like limiting work in progress, we're limiting the number of initiatives in progress. What really matters? If everything matters, nothing matters. And we can get really clear on what really matters. You can say no to things that don't matter and be in better alignment with the things that are the most important in your life. Yeah, it's a really wonderful reflection question. Reflection is the space where you get to put things in perspective. You get to see what's going on. You've got an opportunity to see the context you're in and what your place is in it as well, which I think is really critically important, especially now. But it's always been important. Next question then takes me into what you've seen and what you've learned by 
watching people experience the personal agility side of things. So you've got a lot of case studies in the book and the work that you've done in conscious awareness into how I see myself, how I see my world, what do I do next? What are my decisions? What has surprised you the most about what you've seen? I would say what surprises me the most is the vast array of applications people have gotten incredible success with using personal agility. It's one of those things where we thought this was good. Wow, I think we're onto something. But I don't know if we really realized exactly how good it was or exactly how many results people were going to get across from an individual application to a business application. Peter, I'll turn it over to you to share a little bit more about your thoughts on that. When I first started doing this, someone had told me about the Eisenhower method. What's urgent? What's important? Things that are urgent and important you do yourself and the things that are just important or just urgent you delegate to stuff that's neither urgent nor important you just forget about. And I thought that worked well for a general of the army who could delegate things. My first recollection is, hey, it's my life. I've got no one to delegate to. I've got to live my own life. I started out with my first triage on, on what I would do was because what's important and what's urgent, even though I didn't really know what to prioritize against. Some of our earliest adopters started raising these interesting questions. One was, what about things that make me happy? Is it okay to prioritize that too? My first reaction was, well, sure, just go ahead, put it on your priorities map. You get to decide what matters. But what occurred to me much later is people saying, oh, wow, my happiness is important. And we realized that you are a fully valued participant in your life. It's not just about doing things for other people. You also get to prioritize the things that make you happy. For a lot of people, that's a huge aha moment. Oh, wow, I get to do things just because I want to do them. And uh, doing things that, that makes me happy is okay. I've actually come to the conclusion that if you don't do things that make you happy, that's one of the signs that you're headed for a burnout. Because sooner or later, you're going to realize you're working like crazy and you're doing it for other people and you're getting no satisfaction out of it. Why am I doing it? If that's not the ingredients for a midlife crisis or a burnout, I don't know what is. I think the first thing that emerged was happiness that your own happiness is important. The second thing which emerged was kindness. First, kindness to yourself. Because with personal agility, what you do is you ask yourself clarifying questions to understand first what's important, and then once you've got clarity on what's important, how all the things that you could do, how, how those puzzles fit together. By listening to the answers, you almost develop like empathy for yourself. And so a lot of people, they hear the voices of their parents or their spouses or their in-laws or who knows, you are a bad person. And all of a sudden they're listening to themselves and looking at what they're accomplishing and they say, wow, I get a lot of stuff done. I feel pretty good about that. This is something that appears over and over of people saying, oh, wow, my happiness is important. Oh, wow, I'm doing a pretty good job. I can be nice to myself. The thing that's even more amazing is when you start to be nice to yourself, that it becomes possible to be nice to other people as well. All these things started popping up at the beginning, and every time I coach somebody new, it happens again. The most recent experience was a guy who was in his 70s who's been trying to write a book for 20 years. And he had a voice in the back of his head that said, you're not good enough. Every time he tried to write, bring pen to paper, that voice would somehow, all of a sudden he realized, hey man, I can do this. <laughs> it doesn't matter what happened before. All I gotta do is put pen to paper, I can do that. He became unblocked. A couple of very simple questions enable these really huge changes in attitude and perspective. For me, that's the most exciting and the most surprising and how all these pieces become like building blocks that build on each other. All of a sudden you could do amazing things that seemed impossible just a few weeks ago. What comes to mind, especially about priority setting is process facilitator trained and how you set priorities, really super essential, then important, and then nice. But if you think linearly, you miss out on those moments that say, what makes me happy is really the leverage point for everything else. If I push on that, if I focus on being happy, and I don't mean in a artificial or contrived sense, I mean in a genuine, here's what I really enjoy doing, here's what fills me with energy as opposed to depletes me from energy to keep that balance going so you don't burn out. It's a different way of seeing priority setting. It's, the, it's legitimate for individuals as it is for organizations. We've seen people that have lost over 55 pounds because they started to prioritize their health. People that were struggling, working five jobs, barely getting by to starting their dream business and bringing in six figures the first year, landing six figure clients the next year. 
We've seen people that were completing projects only 24% on time to over 74% on time. Companies turning around from near bankruptcy to profitability and being in the green. A company hitting a $35 million valuation during the pandemic and achieving a three-year roadmap in one year's timeline. From the individual ambitions to the corporate focus, it's that powerful question of what really matters. It applies in both applications, whether it's for yourself or what really matters in your organization. Fractal in that sense. Beautiful. I was just listening to how you were talking about prioritization and they say, okay, let's divide it into very important, important, nice to have, don't forget. We've moved away from that kind of prioritization because there was a woman in, I think, Australia and she was part of a large extended family. She had her children, she had her husband, she had her parents, she had his parents, and then there was another round of extended family. Trying to say that one of them was more important than the other was really delicate. This just does not compute. The things that really matter in your life, they're not necessarily strictly prioritized. For instance, we say, okay, my family is important and there are the, the different levels of relatives and I might want to make that visible, keep track of it and make visible who I'm doing for whom. But it's more about keeping your priorities in balance. If too many things matter, then nothing matters, but you can't drill it down to just one thing that matters. That's just not possible. Most of us don't have that level of focus. And even if we did, it probably wouldn't be very healthy. We got three or four things, maybe five things, and we need to keep them in balance. Okay, and make sure that that, that long-term project, like writing your book, that it gets some attention, even though it can't, for various other reasons, it can't take up all of your day. If you don't write your book, it's not gonna get done, but you still got your job and your bills to pay and the groceries to do and getting enough R&R &R downtime next to your day job. It's about balance. It's not about excessive focus on any one thing. I agree. That's where what I would think of as dynamic equilibrium comes to mind. Context is critical in terms of deciding priorities, but it's also priorities fall into values quite quickly because you really have to look at what is that relationship and what I need to pay attention to in the moment as much as anything. That's the art of being present. In experiencing and in, in observing what people have experienced in the personal agility program, have you had any people that just couldn't get it? Like epic fails in a certain way, but also awesome in another way. What comes to mind is it's the people that didn't actually apply it consistently. <laughs> There are definitely some people that maybe started for like a week and then they didn't continue. You're not really going to see the results if you don't have that new behavior change, visibility. What happens with personal agility, you create your priorities map and you can now visualize what really matters to you. In our minds, we say things like, oh, I want to get in shape. I want to be healthier. But then our actions do not align with the thing we say that matters. The priorities map allows you to brainstorm those possibilities. What are the things that I could do that could support my health or fitness? You look at those things that really matter and you can color code them. And then you can at a glance, see in your priorities map of the things I plan to do this week. Do I have something from each of those categories? When you look at your breadcrumb trail, which is where you start to list what you actually did complete week by week, you're saying, okay, if I look back over the last week, did I do the things that are gonna get me closer to my health goals or did I not? And so it can come from scrolling on hours endlessly for in social media and being up super late at night, not getting enough sleep, which then you don't go to the gym, which means then you just order food from a fast food restaurant. It's a domino effect. When you start to apply the personal agility system, we ask that people apply it for four weeks in order to become a recognized practitioner because you have to have actually applied it for a certain duration of time to get those valuable insights, to be able to see the shifts in your life. If someone just did it for a week, it may not have had a lasting impact because they didn't stick with it long enough to really see and feel the benefits. I think what you're describing for me at least is the difference between understanding the concept and embedding it into your day-to-day -day action and reality and how you think and see in the world. That's a practice process. It's not a superficial, I got the concept, but I don't know how to, a commitment. Commitment is one thing. Obviously, there is no one solution that's perfect for everybody. I talked to a colleague of mine about what really matters and the idea of asking these simple questions on a regular basis, and he just didn't want to do it. It did not resonate him at a very deep level. That's okay. One of the things about personal agility is it's really good for people who want to transform themselves in some way. It's about change. Okay, they don't necessarily know where they want to go, but they know that they're not happy with where they are. If you want to change, then personal agility is a really simple, it's repeatable. Anybody can understand it. You can do it with your kids. 
If you don't want to change, then personal agility might not resonate with you. One of the areas where we're puzzled that we're not getting more resonance is in the area of very successful people. Very successful people say, hey, I've got this under control. I don't need it. And I'm happy. I'm comfortable. Life is good. What, what do I need this for? If you don't feel the need to change, why should you apply something new? Personal agility is completely agnostic about what your goals are and what really matters to you. Personal agility has really no opinion on that whatsoever. If you wanted to use it to maintain the state that you have, you've got this balance and you want to maintain this balance, you can do that. If you have a destination that you want to get to, either in a literal or a metaphorical sense, you could do that with personal agility. Some people it just doesn't resonate with, and that's okay too. They'll go try something else, and we can all still be friends afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> a lovely way of putting it. We can still be friends. <laughs> yeah. But what you're getting at to me is really the core to people that are not necessarily ready for it right now. There's always a gajillion reasons why. Everything from I feel I'm fine the way I am because there's a high level of control needed or there's a high level of comfort in that spot that they're in. We could speculate. But the whole point of it is that timing is timing. And when people are ready, they'll step in and invest in themselves and do something that allows them to function in a much wider level. What's your observation in terms of how personal agility enables you to respond better to some of the bigger issues going on in the world today? Eco-anxiety, there's, there was a pandemic, there is a pandemic, depending on where you are and how the government's handled it. <laughs> there's a pandemic of fear, no question about that. What are your observations about how experiencing personal agility tools and skills enable people a better chance of working with that in a strong and resilient way? A few things that the personal agility system does well is it helps provide clarity on what really matters. That's one of the first powerful questions at the core of it all. It also helps create alignment and look at, okay, what does really matter? And are we in alignment, whether you're applying it as yourself, are you in alignment with things that you say that matter through your actions or with the group or at work? One thing that my mind goes to immediately is looking at in nonprofit groups looking at people that want to make an impact in the world, people that want to actually say, hey, what really matters when it comes to health and vitality in our communities? When we look at as a country, right? Sometimes you can have people be divided just through political reasons. What really matters at the end of the day? Is it fighting against each other or is it creating a better environment for humanity? Is it being able to create an environment where kids feel safe, where they feel they can grow and learn and become the best versions of themselves and follow their dreams. So there's so many different areas of <laughs> where there's challenges or there's areas that we could address with humanity. We can focus on one area. And what I would love to see is being able to help empower more professional organizations and nonprofit organizations that have a cause and help them benefit from the same things that large companies benefit from with Agile. Can we apply this to get that clarity of what really matters, have a systematic way of achieving whatever those goals are, and then have the visibility and the alignment in how we work toward that? When you start to apply personal agility for yourself, you start asking questions about, first of all, there's the what matters question. What could you do? Of those things, what's urgent, what's important, what's going to make you happy? Of all those things, what do I want to do or what do I want to focus on or what do I really want to achieve? Think of yourself as being on a boat. You could be a passenger on that boat in the storm or you can have your hand on the rudder and be looking at the horizon. Or an airplane, it's the same thing. Being a passenger in an airplane in turbulence is a very different experience than being the pilot in turbulence. As a pilot, you're focused on getting that plane safely onto the ground and through the turbulence and whatever. As a passenger, you might be thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna die. And there's really nothing you can do as a passenger. With personal agility, you in effect become the captain of your own boat. You put your hand on the rudder, you're thinking about where you are and where you're going. You've got things to do besides worry about where the boat is being carried by the storm. Most of our case studies that we put in the book actually started well before the pandemic. Our book isn't a pandemic book, but there are a couple of case studies of people who went through really dire transformations, especially when certain parts of the world were very heavily hit by the, uh, by the pandemic with think of islands being isolated from the outside world and the impact that has on their economies. Being able to focus on what really matters, start getting collaborative and creative about how you're gonna solve your problems, that helps people get through the crises. I was thinking about your examples, and particularly thinking through this question, how could personal agility possibly help here? 
The essential message, message of personal agility is empathy. Personal agility teaches you a very simple way to be empathetic. It's real simple. I listen to you, you listen to me, and we care about what the other person has to say. That's empathy. That's practical empathy. And then we can start talking about, well, how do we have conversations where we listen to what the other people have to say? How can we facilitate groups so that they listen to what the other people are saying? We got a lot of divisive topics and a lot of the division comes from people getting into their bubbles and not really feeling a need to listen to what's happening in the other bubbles. People get more isolated, they get more radical and tend to get more suspicious of people living in other bubbles. There's a message in personal agility which is going to be helpful to society. I think it's going to be listen to your neighbor. Listen to them first. If you listen to them, they'll be willing to listen to you. Amazing things happen when you do that. You start to realize that you got much more in common than you thought you did. And that makes it easier to start moving forward to come up with common solutions. I think there's also a connection between personal agility and what you learn from the skills and just how you respond to crisis, your capacity. If you're not panicking, you're going to be able to see what's coming. If you're not cognitively tied up in the to-do list, you've got a better capacity for sensing the, the, what's on the horizon. And there's just a lot of instances where it can apply. People would say, for example, the pandemic Nobody could see it coming. But if you saw the world through a system's lens, you knew there was going to be a correction. But that conversation was happening amongst a very small group because the larger group was not paying attention. I don't know whether we've learned from that or not, but certainly we can learn from it still. We haven't missed all the opportunity yet. There's still plenty of room. But it is very much that space where as long as my mind thinks I'm calm and able to deal with and confident with what's going on in the world, then health is intact. And that's the most fundamental of it all. Going back to the conversation around large global issues like pandemics, did you find or have you noticed that people that have been through personal agility found a disruptive event like a pandemic, which hit it at systems level, hit it personally, it hit at every level, they didn't really miss much. How did people feel they experienced that? Yeah, it's such a great question. One of the things that personal agility helps people with is to see what's in my control, right? So you say, okay, what really matters to me? So there might be all these outside influences from work, stress there, maybe family, relatives, friendships, circumstances happening all around us that are impacting our reality. And especially a global pandemic turned many people's worlds completely upside down. When you look at what really matters and you're visualizing what are the possibilities? Is anything urgent? What am I going to choose to do this week? You realize that you have a choice on what your actions are. A lot of people, we might feel we don't have that choice. We might feel like I have to go to work. I have to be at this job. I have to do this for my family or my kids or my mother or father, right? Taking care of them. There might be a lot of things where we feel obligation. A lot of times people feel like they're on the hamster wheel and they can't stop. They don't know how to stop. Even if you get a raise or make more money, a lot of times people just increase their spending. The quality of life goes up a little bit, but then they're still going paycheck to paycheck, but just on a slightly grander scale. But a lot of times we feel like we are in the movie and we're watching it play out, or maybe we're in the audience just watching the movie and it looks like we're the main actor, but we don't really know what we can do to have an impact in that. And what we want to help people realize is you're not just the actor in your life. You are the person writing the script. You can change that. We often use the navigation metaphor. If you're sailing to Jamaica, if you know what your destination is, well, you might get blown off course, but just be kind to yourself, recognize when you're off course and get back on course. And so you are the captain of that ship. You figure out where you want that ship to go. In a situation where it feels like our choice is taken away or we have to comply with whatever changes are happening in society or with the government or not even being able to leave our homes, the question of what really matters becomes more important. A lot of people were revisiting that concept during the pandemic. There's a lot of people that might've left their jobs or pursued their passion or their dreams. They realized, you know what? I'm not doing what I love. We've had several people that have been between jobs or they might've lost their job during the pandemic and they use the personal agility system to help them get another job. You know, even just looking at that, what's your mindset like when you don't have a job? Oh, I've lost my self-worth. I don't feel valued. I don't feel needed. I feel lost. I had a routine. Now I have no routine. What do I even do in a day? But using something like the personal agility system helps you refocus on what really matters and what you can do and gets you in that more positive mindset 
have you visualizing and seeing what steps you can take every single day toward reaching that next goal. I've had several people able to get great jobs by using the personal agility system to walk them through that. This transition from employment to unemployment is in some ways even more dramatic than the pandemic because it's more personal and it's more clear, even if it's a consequence of the pandemic. Because when you have a job, your life is full. You know what to do. Most of your calendar is filled by your work. You get into work and, and you got things to do and people to talk to and you're part of the system. If you lose your job, you're outside. And we saw these same patterns in a number of different contexts. One of them was military veterans in the US. Military is an extremely structured environment. They teach people amazing things. One of the things that I've really been impressed by is how much they learn about leadership which I think is knowledge that's going totally to waste in the civilian economy because the civilian economy for the most part doesn't value that very much, although we really need it because organizations need to be more resilient. The way an organization becomes resilient is when everybody can see the big picture, they know how what they're doing fits into the big picture. They've got objectives which they go off and achieve. If things are different than expected, they know how to react. If they're confronted with something unexpected, they can take command of the situation and make decisions. That's something the military people learn how to do, which they're almost not allowed to do when they get into the civilian economy. It's, it's more complicated than what I just explained. But basically, as a result of that, they can get awfully lost. Being able to refocus on what matters, having something to orient on, finding your purpose, finding your mission, as they call it, having something to do. Yes, you're in a storm, but you got your hand on the boat and that boat's got to go someplace. That gives you the, the strength and the resilience to handle adversity. We've seen a lot of cases like that. In fact, that's one of my hopes that someone will heard this podcast and say, hey, we've got a group of veterans or a group of people who are retirees or coming out of school. People coming out of school also have a similar problem, big change in the environment from having structure to a lack of structure, needing to create your own structure, going from being employed to being self-employed. You got to create your own structure. You have to be able to lead yourself. And that's what personal agility ultimately is. It's a framework for leading yourself. And that makes it possible for you to be resilient in the face of adversity. Great description. It allows me to think about the shift that I've been witnessing, which is we've always relied on security from the outside. Do I have a job? Do I have the right social network around me? What are the things that define me from the outside? The more complex issues, more volatility, definitely more ambiguity in the environment is to shift to the inside so that your security is found within. And you've got a set of skills and tools that you can rely on to guide yourself out of messes that you're in, or at least be comfortable in the mess. I think one of the reasons why we're not transforming organizations fast enough or taking the big jumps that needed to, to be taken is that people are very uncomfortable with the mess. They want that certainty. They want to know what's going to happen. It's being aware of context. And when your context changes, it's an opening for big shifts to happen. I think that's very exciting myself. Any thoughts that provokes? You know, I, I, organizations, the way they are today, were basically created how management works was basically created at the beginning of the 20th century. The philosophical underpinnings were laid with the foundation of companies or at the founding of companies like General Motors when they were perfected by the 50s and they were starting to creak around the 70s and 80s when computers started happening and it really came to a head in the 90s when the internet happened. Things get faster and faster and faster. So we're trying to reinvent ourselves. And the problem is we have this stable system which is very centrally controlled and that's one way of doing things. And we're heading towards a system which is going to be much more decentralized, much more independent agents collaborating with each other. But there's this period of instability where the control doesn't really work, but hasn't really let go yet. And, and the decentralized agents aren't quite able to do the job yet. That's the exciting part. That's where you don't know what's going to happen. When you think about things like social stability with those kind of changes where people are going to get angry with each other and do bad things to each other, this is the risky time. I think that we're in a risky time as we haven't quite let go of the old, but the new hasn't quite established itself yet. Yeah, that's fair enough. I think the only reason we're in the risk is that we're resorting to really simple solutions instead of digging deeper into capacity and, and creative talent. The easy solution is to go and get rid of the problem using a gun or violence. The real solution has to do with empathy, conversations, working with people who you don't agree with. That really takes a much more courageous level of leadership, if you will. One of the things we notice in our organizational case studies, what made all of the case studies happen was empathy listening to the other people, listening for understanding, not to debate. Debating doesn't help you anywhere, help you at all. 
Rod Collins, former CEO at Blue Cross Blue Shield, said, there's no such thing as a constructive debate. It drives people into their corners, and it makes consensus and compromise almost impossible. The alternative is empathy. Listen to people, listen to what the other person says, let them finish their sentences, let them finish their thoughts. And then when they've finished expressing what they have to express, that's the moment where they're willing to listen to what you have to say. Then you can start to make visible what you have in common. All of a sudden you realize you've got a lot more in common. Even in our divided society today, I think if we start talking about the things that we have in common, we're gonna discover that we have a lot of things in common. That's gonna give us something to build on. One thing we have in common is hope for the future. <laughs> I'm just reading Jane Goodall's book on, called Hope, <laughs> which is about the future as well. Have you seen any similarity in people all of a sudden getting the aha moment that says, yeah, I really need to start within and then shift from there? I think the, the thing that surprised me the most that I didn't anticipate was in my own personal experience, it was that feeling of fulfillment and not just achievement. What we started to hear from several people early on was that they were happier. I didn't anticipate that, right? Like we think of agile, we think of, hey, let's be more efficient. Let's be more effective in what we do. But then when you look at, okay, I'm actually in alignment with things that matter to me, a wonderful side effect of that is being happier. It helps you be in better alignment with the people around you. That was one of the biggest surprises. It was a delightful surprise that I wasn't anticipating. That's really a lovely observation because you've discerned between two things, achievement and happiness. And a lot of people would connect them and think they're hardwired, but they're not, in fact. What I see over and over is people realize, it's, it's that moment when people, Maria described it as this film moment where everything in the background is getting a little bit blurry and a little bit fuzzy and you're moving in slow motion. And this is the point where they realize that something that they thought mattered didn't and something that wasn't on their radar screen really does matter. Very often it's their own happiness. Very often it's about some voice in the back of their head somehow holding them down. And all of a sudden they realize, oh, I don't have to do this anymore. And they realize that what really matters to them is something different. All of a sudden they can communicate that. And it's like they're different people. I've seen that happen in individuals quite a lot. What's also interesting is to see this in organizations because what we do with organizations is we build on the same patterns. For instance, we've got purpose, celebration, celebrate what you got done, choice, choose what you want to do moving forward. These three things together enable you to navigate. Now, add in cadence. We're going to do that, take a fix and reflect on where we're going at regular intervals. We suggest weekly intervals. And all of a sudden, you've got the ability to achieve long-term goals because you're keeping the eye on the ball on those long-term goals, this regular celebrate and choose. And the dialogue that enables you to pull these things out you can use it with other people as well. And all of a sudden you start creating empathy. And from empathy, you can create alignment. Now, when a group of people who have influence are in agreement about what really matters, all of a sudden it's relatively easy for them to make decisions. And I think this is a problem that organizations have. They don't have this concept of cadence in their decision-making, most of them. Some of them do. And some of the do are producing really spectacular results take these same building blocks and apply them in the organization. All of a sudden you've got an organization that can make decisions and then move forward on it without political resistance. All of a sudden you can be responsive. All of a sudden you can stay focused on your goals long enough to, get, to accomplish them. These are aha moments. For me, the aha moment though was one of our first case studies that applied cadence at the organizational level. They'd actually previously tried to achieve these goals using traditional methods for two years and failed, okay? And then they said, well, let's try this agile approach, which among other things includes cadence and empathy and alignment on what really matters. And six months later, they'd achieved all their goals, okay? Now, the funny thing is, when I talked to people afterwards, they were saying, man, it felt like this went slowly. And then, oh, wait a minute, but we had tried to do that in the previous two years. And we did more in six months than we did in the previous two years. So there's this kind of disconnect between what's really happening and how you perceive that. This is for me the strangest result to come out of personal agility. You're much faster, but somehow it doesn't feel that way, at least at the organizational level. 
that there's this disconnect between perception and reality. But I guess that's an interesting question, which is more important, the perception or the reality? <laughs> well, actually, that's something that, that several people have said when they stop and they reflect the, the weekly celebrate and choose cadence, they look at what they got done and they are surprised at how much they achieved. And when you actually make it visible, people are like, wow, I actually did way more than I thought. And so a lot of times individuals feel like, I don't feel like I'm making any progress or getting anywhere, but when I look back at my breadcrumb trail, I can see, oh, I've done way better than I realized. And so there's something about that visibility. There's something about being able to bring it to the surface. Sometimes that might get lost in a larger organization, right? Because they're turning away, they're doing a lot of the work and they might not realize how much progress they got done until they stop and reflect on that. And when they say, wait a minute, we did do that in six months instead of two years. It's really that pause that helps people to see that. Yeah, exactly. Somebody asked me one time when I was doing some facilitation work, how do you build organizational intuition? And I thought, whoa, okay, let me go to school on that. Great question. As I reflected on it over the years, seeing what the ingredients are, one of the ingredients is empathy, because that leads you to listening to the intuition of the organization that's embedded, it's under the surface. You can't see it, you can't touch it, but you can sense it. That reflection aspect, stopping the wheel for a second, jumping off and just saying, well, what do we see? What have I experienced here? That's everything. That just means a whole lot in terms of developing that capability. Final question for you. Where do curious people go for more information? Yep, they can check out the Personal Agility Institute website at personalagilityinstitute.org. We also have an online community that we have put together as well as we have the book coming out. So I want to invite people to get the book and it's being launched through the Business Agility Institute on Amazon. But personalagilityinstitute.org, you can check out our body of knowledge, our case studies, join our online community and join in the conversation, as well as different courses we have, workshops from our ambassadors and trainers. We've got around 30 ambassadors globally around over 10 countries. It's really exciting to see how the interest in personal agility has been spreading. We're sharing a lot of these resources and stories right on our website. I want to thank both of you very much for joining me today. Any parting thoughts from either you, Peter or Maria? Really, we just want to remind people to Take a pause out of your busy day and ask that question, what really matters? Stop and reflect. Ask yourself that question. Am I happy? Are the things I'm doing in alignment with what I really want? Too often we get caught up in the busyness of life and we don't necessarily ask ourselves that question enough. And so Personal Julie provides a friendly invitation to do so. I like to think of the tools of personal agility as a friend who you can always go back to. And even if you've ignored them for a while, they're going to be okay with that. The questions of personal agility are still there. The answers are still there. Maybe you have to update the columns a little bit to bring it up to date or clean it out so you can start afresh, whatever. But they're still there. The questions are always there and they're always there to help you. And the other thing to remember is time is your most precious currency. You only get to use it once. Your health is your most valuable asset. If you lose it, you may never find it again. And these things give you a little something to reflect on as you're thinking through what really matters as you're charging through life. So you stop and think and say, well, what do I really care about? My hope is that after thinking about these questions, you'll spend a little bit more time on stuff that you care about and a little bit less of your time on stuff that you don't. Beautiful. Thank you both very much for being on the program. Amidst the chaos and uncertainty of not knowing what's going to happen next, of basically living life at this point in time, you always have control over how you respond, what you do with the conditions you're in. It helps a great deal to stay centered. And the more you're conscious of your reaction to what is going on around you, your feelings, your tendencies, the, the better chance you've got of navigating these level of uncertainty extremely well. At minimum, to be aware of what power you have to lead yourself with calm confidence. Share this with people who you feel will benefit from the information. Thank you very much for joining me. 